So let's move on to the second paper for this session. And, and this second paper deals with the issue of trust. Uh, and, and the paper basically has a great introduction saying that financial markets and, and banks, well, they run on trust and they stumble in the absence of trust. And we have really seen crystal clear evidence uh, of this in the last few months in the US, for example. Uh, the paper makes a convincing case that the take up of sovereign investment in foreign countries, well, it has a significant and also economically important link to the amount of trust placed in the residents, uh, relatively speaking, in this country itself. And this holds at bank level also. Uh, here, the, the paper argues that banks with branch networks, which are geographically well diversified and, and also whose management teams are well diversified, well, they are less likely to suffer from trust bias in these financing uh, decisions here. Uh, and the paper argues that the effect of stereotypes is persistent uh, over time and, and stronger for less diversified banks. But, so the paper will be presented by Orkun Saka at City University of London, together with Barry Eisengreen from uh, Berkeley, and both of them are dialing in remotely for this session. Uh, as to the discussion, this will be Eleonora Alabrese from University of Warwick. So let me hand over to the presenters. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the nice introduction. And I wish I could be there, but uh, I couldn't be this time because of the family commitments. And thanks for the organizers uh, for allowing me to present the paper in online uh, version. So um, I guess I have 20 minutes. I'm going to start quickly. So this is a paper on cultural stereotypes, and it's a co-authored work with uh, Barry Eichengreen. Uh, next slide. So we know that cultural stereotypes are quite prevalent. And here on the right side of the, of the, of the slide, you, what you can see is a recent cover from the magazine Economist, where the, the prime minister of the UK at the time was pictured as an Italian soldier, uh, especially you know, referring to the kind of mess that she may uh, have created at the time uh, because of the new budget that she had introduced. But of course, you, know, you can see all uh, kind of symbols of, of, of the stereotyping uh, in this very picture. And it, shows you that uh, you know the cultural stereotypes even in the age of the political uh, correctness they are well uh, alive uh, in 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 the minds of of, of people even you know at the, at the sophisticated magazines like the economist so we know that they are historically determined and they change very slowly right but at the same time one could say is uh, are all stereotypes wrong uh, is there any grain of truth in it so that's, that's another separate discussion. There might be certain fundamentals that may create, for instance, you know, the, a certain perception of a certain nation by anyone else. So in this paper, I'm going to try to tell you like how we are trying to separate biases from the fundamentals that uh, will come later. But our main focus in terms of you know, capturing the cultural stereotypes is going to be focusing on how nations perceive each other in terms of trustworthiness, right? So how one nation's citizens or residents uh, perceive another uh, nation's citizens or residents in terms of how trustable they are. Next slide. So uh, we know that cultural closeness matters in financial markets. There's quite a bit of evidence by now, both within country evidence and also international evidence showing that, for instance, uh, investors are underweighting culturally distant markets when, when they are investing. And also within the same country, for instance, they are investing into such companies who with whom they have they are sharing more co cultural uh, heritage. But of course, you know, the, the tricky part is that, is it really the higher trust that these people have, or is it just that with these distant type of investment opportunities, are they just lacking information? So that's discouraging them uh, from like investing uh, further. Next slide. So in this paper, we are going to kind of try to uh, dig into this cultural trust phenomenon by looking at the financial institutions. So for this purpose, we are going to be focusing on uh, the Europe, and we think that this is an ideal laboratory. Uh, and I think I don't have to uh, say too much in this audience that you know uh, we have the supranational supervision of banks in Europe. We have homogeneous regulatory treatment of the government bonds, which is going to be the uh, focus of our paper in terms of investment opportunities. And what we also know from previous literature is that there is quite a bit of divergence in terms of how nations see each other, in terms of you know how trustworthy the residents are. So this has been shown by Guza et al., for instance, by using Eurobarometer surveys in the past and uh, many other following uh, papers that I'll mention later too. So we're, what we are doing is uh, we are merging this uh, you know unique EBA data set that I will detail later uh, with this uh, with this. Uh, 
trust phenomenon both by using the Eurobarometer, but also like I will, I'll tell you later that we are also uh, collecting our own data set uh, to kind of update these measures and also like kind of expand them uh, compared to the original survey. So we are going to construct not only at country level trust measures, but we are also going to dig into the bank level trust measures by using the, the branch networks of the banks in Europe. And we are gonna, I'm going to show you what is the micro foundation there, uh, because we're going to look at several channels uh, or kind of hypothesize about several channels through which uh, in which the, the banks can actually uh, might be affected in terms of their culture uh, because of their uh, branch networks in different parts of of Europe. So in our identification uh, with the bank level evidence, we are going to be focusing on banks that are headquartered in the same home country, in the same uh, country at the same point in time, and we are going to compare them only with regards to their exposures towards the same target country sovereign. So this is going to be kind of tight in the sense that, for instance, any kind of shocks that will operate, for instance, in terms of, you know, uh, some countries getting into a crisis, their sovereign risk rising, this is not going to be, you know, uh, affecting or uh, our identification strategy. So what we are going to be taking is basically taking the uh, previous uh, literature from country level to bank level evidence, and I'm going to show you why the, the how why we can uh, kind of reach to the bank level evidence by showing a kind of micro foundation for why culture is important uh, with regards to bank branches. Next uh, slide. So there's quite a bit of literature. I'm not going to delve into many of them, uh, especially the first part is quite important. As I told you, there, there has been some examples in the recent literature showing uh, about uh, looking at the effect of trust in different dimensions. Uh, this has included, for instance, foreign direct investments, portfolio investments, even the decentralization decisions of multinational banks are influenced by the trust across countries. Uh, venture capital investments, and also like uh, more, more lately, we have seen that even the stock recommendations of equity analysts uh, were affected by the, uh, by the, by the trust uh, of their home countries towards the, uh, the country of the firm that they are analyzing. But all of this evidence is very much at the country level. So we're going to discuss a little bit later about, you know, why country level evidence is, is kind of, you know, um, hard to trust on, um, uh, no pun intended, uh, but we are going to kind of uh, try to kind of dig more and bring this bank level evidence to for for better identification, and then there is uh, two two more literatures that we contribute to, but I'm not going to discuss in detail those. Especially the last one is quite I think familiar to to most of you, uh, looking at the sovereign determinants of the sovereign exposures in Europe. So next slide. So. Uh, this is this is what identification strategy looks at the country level. Uh, when you have this, you know, home countries and target countries, of course, you're looking into country pair relationships. You can use in this setting home country fix effects and target country fix effects, and the trust is going to operate only within certain country pair, right? So you you can include home country and target country fix effects, but you 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 will also have concern for many omitted variables that may be operating between different countries, right? So in the bank level, uh, uh, in in terms of you know taking this to the to the bank level, we have started thinking with uh, my co-author about you know how we can uh, uh, kind of operationalize a bank level measure of trust, and then we started thinking about the branch networks of of the of the European banks. Next slide, so. In that sense, uh, I, we, we think that especially when it comes to the sovereign debt market, uh, the branch networks would be important, at least for three different mechanisms. So we, we thought that you know one mechanism would be that some of the sovereign debt investment decisions could be delegated to the branches and the local branch will make the purchase, in which case the local branch culture is going to be important in terms of determining the overall portfolio of the bank. Uh, however, this seems to be a little bit of a, uh, at least anecdotal evidence suggests that this may not be uh, the, 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 the main channel, uh, also because of the fact that we are focusing on the exit entry decisions of, of banks into sovereign debt markets of a, of a country, which means that the, these decisions are really important decisions and uh, they're more likely to be centrally decided uh, by, the, by the headquarters. The other two channels, one channel could be that, you know, the, the headquarters, when they are making their decisions of uh, sovereign investments, they may be affected by the biased, culturally biased information that may be coming from various branches uh, that they have in Europe. Uh, this might be one channel, but we cannot observe this as we don't have this uh, access to confidential reports of the, of the internal reports of the banking system. However, uh, a third channel, which is, I think, a bit more intuitive and also we can observe the data for is the fact that branches also send employees to the, to the, to the headquarters, right? When you have, for, when you're a UK bank and you have branches in Spain, it's likely that you are going to start employing more Spanish employees, even in your headquarters in UK. And if the decisions are made in the headquarters, the Spanish employees um, are going to impact the the, the way that you uh, decide on those investments. And we are, I'm going to show you evidence uh, today for, for this channel as well. So next slide. 
So when we take the uh, branches seriously, this is what the, uh, what the identification strategy is gonna look like. Just to give you an example for a single country um, uh, like UK, uh, we're comparing, let's say, three banks, HSBC, RBS, and Lloyds here. What we have is, for instance, HSBC, we know that it has branches, it has quite a bit of branch presence in France, as opposed to RBS, which uh, is headquartered again in UK, but uh, has branches not in France, but in Ireland, right? Five to 10% of its branches, I think, uh, are in Ireland. So what happens in our setting is that the HSBC is gonna have a different, slightly different culture than the RBS, because of the fact that its culture is gonna be a combination of the cultures of France and, and UK. On the other hand, RBS is gonna have a combined culture of UK and Ireland. So how, how these two banks will perceive Austria, the same target country when they are investing is gonna depend on this, on this combined culture. Uh, so we are gonna be comparing these two banks basically uh, within the same country with service the same target country. And of course, you, can, you might be concerned that you know, we, 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 we are also comparing these, these banks with regards to their own countries. That, that also some, is something that we show um, is, is not really important. We drop, for instance, UK here. We drop all the exposures to France and Ireland for these two banks. And we only compare them to the countries where none of these banks have direct branch presence. So that kind of gives us an ideal situation to, to make a comparison to kind of cut off all the informational links that you might uh, be thinking of. Also, like uh, another concern could be the indirect relationships. Maybe HSBC has better information because France uh, is closer informationally to Austria or uh, Ireland is closer to our Austria. So RBS has better information. We also try to control for that by looking at these indirect relationships. Next slide. So this is the Eurobarometer data. I'm not going to look too much of it. Our definition is going to be at the, at the country level. It's the percentage of people in the home country expressing a lot of trust towards uh, the people in the target country. And then I'll tell you how we kind of turn this into a bank level measure. Next slide. So about the EBA data sets, I think I don't have to talk too much. So this this has been, uh, this is, uh, I think most of you are familiar with these. Uh, it has been almost 11 years of uh, data collection, the data disclosures from the EBA and also its predecessor. Um, and we have collected all this data um, and it shows us uh, in some disclosures, uh, sovereign uh, breakdowns of the portfolio in terms of country by country breakdowns, up to 200 countries. We only focus on the 30, countries that we can consistently find in each of these disclosures. And this gives us um, 199 banks in total located in 27 European countries in 11 years. This is kind of a biannual data. So like we, we see almost in every six months. Next slide. So this is the just summary statistics, nothing to mention here, uh, but we have also quite a lot of controls um, uh, coming from different uh, sources. Next slide. So this is going to be the empirical setting for the country level evidence. So it's going to be basically like a gravity regression. Uh, country level trust bias is going to be turned into a, so, sorry, country level trust that I have just uh, shown you the matrix for is going to be turned into a bias by taking into account the effect of home country and exposure country or target country fixed effects. So we just look at the residual from that regression, first of all, and then we plug that residual into the, into the regression that you see in the, uh, in the below. Uh, where the main dependent variable is the sovereign exposure of a bank, uh, B, uh, headquartered in uh, country H, uh, with regards to target country C at the point uh, time T. And this is going to be a dummy variable. As, as I said, we are mainly focusing on the entry exit decisions, but I'm going to show you the results with the continuous measure as well. Uh, and the country level bias is only going to change between home country and, and target country. Okay, we have bank time fixed effects here. We have target country time fixed effects, but of course we cannot include country pair fixed effects because that's the main uh, variable of interest here. So let's uh, move to the next slide. So here, what I'm doing is basically I'm looking at the uh, standalone effect of the trust bias, which is positive as you can see in the first column. And then I'm comparing it to various structural informational measures or historical measures that are also operating uh, at country pairs and uh, from the from the columns uh, two to nine, what you're seeing is basically pairwise comparison of how they are doing with a, with, a, with the trust bias variable. And you see that you know some of them are actually you know correlated with the trust bias variable, so that's why they are eating up the coefficient. But in all the settings, the coefficient seems to be not, none of these variables uh, stand alone uh, is able to. Uh, uh, eat away the, the coefficient from the trust bias. And in the final, in the final uh, column, what you're seeing is basically like a, a kitchen sink type of regression where I'm putting all the uh, uh, 
uh, various uh, controls or let's say variables that might affect uh, country pair relationships. Uh, and the, the, the trust still comes out uh, quite significant. But this kind of relationships uh, or this kind of regressions that has been done in the um, previous literature is really tricky to interpret because most of these variables that I'm including, such as you know, geographical distance, like sharing a colonial relationship, et cetera, these may affect trust, first of all. And also some of these, such as bank mergers or media coverage, they may be impacted by the trust across countries. So there is all this, you know, all types of relationships that are going on between the, uh, the, the independent variables here that, that makes it very hard to, to interpret the coefficient in, in this kind of relationship. So let's move on to the next slide. This is where we are going to kind of focus on the mechanism and we why we are going to I'm going to tell you why we are taking this branch presence or branch networks more seriously. So here we have the headquarter employee list of, of a subset of banks in our sample and we can actually observe their nationality at various levels. So we know the positions of the people. So we are looking at the uh, highest positions here and we are uh, this is just a cross section. There is no time variation. Uh, we are trying to see if the branch presence in a country for a bank is able to predict the nationality composition of its employees in the headquarters of the bank, right? And if you can move to the next slide, this seems very much to be the case, at least for the subset of banks that we have in the sample. Uh, it seems that when you have a branch in a, in a certain country in Europe, uh, also your headquarter employees are coming more likely to be uh, from that country. Of course, we are not arguing for causality here. It's just a simple correlation in a sense. Uh, it can be also reverse causality that's going on here, but we are just showing this to, to show that this is consistent with, with our argument uh, that the, the one of the one of the channels could be the, uh, the employee channel. So let's move on to the next slide. And this is going to be our bank level uh, analysis where we are basically using the weight, uh, the, the, the amount of branches that uh, each bank has for the multinational banks operating in, uh, in more than one country, uh, their, their branch presence in a different country is going to be weight uh, of, of that country. And we are going to kind of uh, take a weighted average of the, of the perceptions of the host country uh, and then create like a bank level variable for the, for the trust bias. And the regression looks very similar on the dependent variable, but on the right side, on the right hand side, now we have uh, actually, we are, we are able to include uh, a kind of a more flexible set of fixed effects, both at the country pair levels, but also we can saturate it with country pair time uh, fixed effects. Let's move on to the next slide. And here you are seeing the, the, the main results for the, for the bank level trust, trust. It seems to be a similar coefficient to the, to the previous uh, variable at the country level. Uh, and then we are also controlling for whether or not these um, uh, banks have direct branch presence and how many uh, branches they have in the target countries that we are comparing them in. Uh, and that also doesn't seem to be uh, very important in, in taking away uh, the effect of the trust bias. And in terms of economic magnitude here, one standard deviation increase in the trust bias increases the probability of investing in the target country by 14%. And this is quite large. Why? Because the unconditional mean of our uh, dependent variable, the sovereign exposure is 58% in our sample. So this is uh, quite large compared to that, uh, that sample mean. Let's move to the next slide. So this is basically how it looks like in case some of you are worried that our effects are coming mainly from the Eurozone crisis, which is in the early part of the uh, of our sample. It doesn't seem to be the case. What you are seeing in the middle is a gray region or green shaded region where our coefficients are smaller. And that is exactly the episode where uh, the disclosures, EBA disclosures started depending on the FINREP uh, reports and FINREP, FINREP reports actually uh, demand less uh, granularity in terms of country breakdowns because it has a threshold. If you are exposed to a certain country below that threshold, you don't have to disclose that country. You can just put it in the other category. And uh, it's, this is a proof that for, for better identification, uh, we, need, uh, we need proper granularity in this data set. And then as soon as the FINREP uh, disclosures have ended and then uh, the, the previous setting kicked in, uh, again, we see the, the, the coefficients are again uh, quite stable and high. Uh, even in the in the last part of our uh, sample period. Let's move on. This is the same picture, but using the dependent variable as the continuous measure instead of the entry exit decisions. Let's move on. So then we are doing several cross-sectional tests. For instance, if we drop all the domestic exposures, this is what the result looks like. So it, it doesn't look like the home bias is the is the uh, the usual home bias and sovereign exposures is the is the reason why we are observing this effect. Let's move on. 
So uh, when we have the when we when we drop all the home country exposures, but also as I mentioned to you in the identification strategy, when we drop all those observations, all those target countries where none of the banks that we are comparing has any branches, right? So this is a very uh, tight way of identifying the effect, uh, we believe. And if anything, the coefficients are actually uh, going uh, up uh, much larger than, than than the main results. So let's move on to the next slide. And here, as I told you, we are also controlling the indirect linkages that the host countries might uh, give to the to the banks, uh, such as, for instance, France giving an advantage to 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 HSBC or Ireland giving an advantage to uh, to RBS with service their exposures to Austria. So we, we basically calculate these relationship variables exactly in the same way that we calculated the trust bias by using the the branches as as weights. And then we look at, for instance, merger, media, political relationships, and branch relationships, etc. And none of these seem to be really important in this setting. Trust bias seems to be the uh, the, the, the driver, uh, even in the regressions when we include the lactose. Let's move on yeah, to the well, next slide. Well, you, have, you have one more minute, uh, and yeah, I'll sure. ask you to wrap up. Thanks. Sure. So here is an IV result where we kind of like thought, OK, is this really uh, culture? And how can we really make sure that you know the, there, is, um, um, there is an exogenous variation in that? So we look at these six different uh, measures of um, cultural differences across countries. These are you know, arguably historically determined. Some of them are genetically determined. Uh, so they, they are uh, good candidates for instruments. And we instrument the, the trust bias uh, by using the six different dimensions and then estimate the effect on the sovereign exposure and see, uh, as you can see here, the F-stats on the first stage are quite high. And then we, we see a much higher, uh, larger coefficient on the trust bias when we look at the second stage. Um, let's move on. When we look at the Eurozone banks only, this this also uh, you know doesn't change anything. Let's move on. When we look at the weak countries in the in the Europe, such as you know Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, Spain, this doesn't change the result. Let's move on. So when we also look at the set of banks that are only regulated by the single supervisor mechanism, so just in case you know what we are capturing is not the effect of the uh, of the bank, but also the maybe it's the effect of the local regulator that's kind of demanding the sovereign exposures of the bank to be in, in a certain way. This doesn't you know this doesn't seem to be the story really here because now in this sample all the banks are being regulated by the same regulator. So that again um, you know doesn't change the result. If anything, the coefficient is larger. And then uh, we can move on to the heterogeneity. We can skip this. Uh, and then maybe more importantly, when, when there is a crisis, when we look at the you know, Eurozone crisis episode and may, when we interact the, the, the trust variable with the, with the occurrence of a crisis in the target country, um, this seems to be uh, really important. In the baseline, you can see that, uh, for instance, when we, include, when we calculate the crisis with bond spreads or CDS spreads, in the baseline, trust bias is still important. But when it's interacted with the, with the, with the Eurozone crisis, it seems that the importance of trust uh, is magnified with the occurrence of a, of a crisis. Yeah, let's move on. And then in the work in progress, what we are doing is basically uh, to collect our own data set. As I said, uh, one of the good things about uh, collecting this data set across 30 countries, this is going to help us to include more banks and more target countries in our sample, because the Eurobarometer is only consists of 15 by 15 metrics. Uh, and then this is kind of the preliminary results. What you are seeing here is the persistency of the cultural stereotypes. So there are almost 26 years between the two surveys, the one that we made and the, the Eurobarometer. But you can see this very high, very positive, strong correlation between the perceptions of trust across uh, European nations uh, when you compare this uh, these two surveys. And this is very promising. I think this kind of shows that there is very strong persistence in the in the trust perceptions. And then when we actually apply this uh, enlarged uh, survey to to our uh, to our uh, banking sample, we actually find that our results go through. So this also kind of points to the external validity of our results. Let's move on. So uh, to conclude, we are kind of um, in this paper aiming to extend the economics finance literature on cultural stereotypes, specifically on trust, by proposing a tighter identification strategy. And we kind of show also why uh, we can do that by uh, looking at the mechanisms where the, the branches of the banks can affect the, the trust at the headquarters. Uh, and of course, in our setting, the implication is that this is likely to be inefficient because there is no reason uh, why a, 
a specific bank in a country compared to another bank in the same country should perceive the sovereign as more or less risky based on their uh, you know, trust perceptions. So if this is the case, especially in a setting where you know, the, the contracts are not relational, when a, when a sovereign uh, defaults, they default on everyone. In this kind of a setting, it's really uh, uh, kind of implying an inefficiency. And uh, one, uh, I think, impl important implication is the diversity. So in our setting, if you have uh, boards or if you have branch networks that are more diversified, then actually the positive and negative biases in, in uh, different regions will actually cancel out each other. So diversity is key if, if cultural stereotypes are uh, driving uh, investment decisions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Otto Hawkins. So uh, let me hand over to Edo Noah Elabrese that will uh, lead the discussion role. Thanks. Cool. OK. Um, thanks a lot for quite an interesting uh, read. Um, OK, so let me be brief. Um, OK, so to summarize a little bit the, the paper, so these are the, the objectives of the paper. So the, the, the paper wants to test uh, whether the trust of the residents uh, of a bank in target countries uh, affects the sovereign, um, the sovereign cross-border exposure of multinational banks. And it does so by looking and exploiting the, um, the network infrastructure of, uh, of these uh, banks and whether that affects uh, the culture at bank headquarters. And by, uh, by doing this, it uses this bank-specific measure of culture that differ uh, at the level of the headquarters and may in fact impact this exposure. Now, in terms of key, uh, key results, this, uh, this trust um, indeed impacts positively, significantly, and importantly, uh, the diversification of the investment of these multilateral banks, multinational banks, and when these um, when the analysis is refined at the bank-specific measure of bank expo of culture, which again crucially differ at the bank headquarters, so this confirms the results. Now, in terms of magnitude, as you mentioned, um, and this is uh, mostly focused on entry and exit, the, margin, uh, the magnitudes are quite large. And in fact, one standard deviation increase in, the, in this trust uh, margin increases the chances that a bank invests in a target country by 14%, which corresponds to um, a third of the diversification gap. And I also find quite interesting the heterog uh, heterogeneity in the results. Um, so um, one big point that is indeed that the most diversified can, um, banks in terms of the countries in which they invest, um, indeed rely, these banks rely less on, on trust and the flip side of this is that actually trust is particularly important for countries that are less often targeted. And in this case, a, a, a classic counterexample would be Germany. And, and finally, it is quite interesting for me to see that indeed um, trust, the trust element is particularly influential for countries and timing of crisis. And this is um, done by looking at this um, initial period between 2010 and 2015. Now, this paper, I would say that, um, that the, the magnitude per se are not particularly surprising, but where the, the big contribution of this, of this paper is actually the identification, which I think is quite neat and relies on these uh, bank-specific measures of trust. And indeed, without repeating too much, but this, uh, this uses the, lev the, the country, um, the geography of the branch networks of this bank, and, uh, and whether this impacts the culture at the air quarter level. And indeed, they show this relationship between the composition of broad banks, which maps um, the branch network. And this allows not only to, um, to control for uh, country confounders, but also, and crucially, this country paid level of, um, of potential factors that may confound this relationship. Now, on the comments, so in terms of mechanism, you rely on the fact that potentially these, um, 
the trust of these uh, branch employees is transmitted to the headquarter via this uh, common practice of, um, of uh, promoting internally. And in this case, uh, by so doing, this paper makes a parallel with, uh, between cultural stereotypes and gender bias. Now, the literature on gender bias does shows that uh, diversification in terms of gender does improve the performance of firms and also affects uh, the bank lending policies. Now, in this respect, it would be extremely interesting to see whether this is the case also for this cultural diversity. And, and furthermore, as I said, the paper documents that this um, trust uh, differential affects the portfolio composition of these banks, and this generates in some inefficient uh, portfolio allocation. But to some extent, we know this already, as, as this is quite similar to the own bias. And in general, we know that uh, trust uh, matters. And, and I would like perhaps to, to read a little bit more why should we expect that in this context, uh, uh, this might not be, um, be the, the case. And furthermore, um, a little bit more on the implication of the papers. So it would be nice to expand a little bit um, on the implication of the paper. And uh, in this respect, this relates to my, um, my first comment. And so given that these might affect firms' performances, uh, why are these banks not, uh, not trying to eliminate this cultural bias? And should we perhaps uh, impose uh, some regulation in terms of diversification of this sovereign, sovereign portfolio? Okay, and finally, some additional uh, uh, points, uh, um, but you mentioned it uh, um, at the end a little bit. So at the moment, the paper uses a uh, time invariant um, measure of trust, um, which is also not super recent. And so it is very promising indeed And to think of some time varying and more recent uh, uh, measure of trust, uh, which would allow also to um, to look at this time variation, however uh, persistent trust may be. And finally, I do find extremely interesting this heterogeneity in, uh, um, uh, with respect of uh, exposure to, um, to crisis. And to this respect, you focus on this period uh, between 2010 and 2015. So I wonder what, uh, what would happen uh, when you use the full sample instead. And perhaps I uh, would find it interesting to see whether uh, in more recent times this relationship and this interaction kind of vanishes um, or diminishes. And and yes, just uh, one last point, I think that, uh, um, that although it's, uh, it's nice and relevant to look at the extensive margin, it would be also nice to have uh, a slightly better understanding of the intensive margin as well. Um, but overall, I find this, uh, this identification quite neat and the paper was extremely enjoyable to read, so thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Eleonora. So uh, with this, we move on to the Q&A session. Uh, we'll use the same modalities as last time, so take all of the questions in a row, and then uh, we can hear answers after that. Uh, so when you intervene here, please state your name and affiliation, and, and in the WebEx, please use the, the chat or raise your flag. So I think the first question was over here. And then, Jakob, you're next. Good morning from my side. Uh, Nikos Grapsas from Malta Financial Services Authority. Uh, one question to the author uh, is uh, regards the control variable. So I understand that uh, you focus on the number of branches, but uh, as we see banks moving to a digital uh, business line and they try to reduce the number of branches uh, in their business model, perhaps we should uh, consider change in the control variable from with a variable that would be more on the retail side of business. So. When we have, let's say, a big number of branches in a bank, we intuitively think that this bank wants to have a retail presence in this country. So perhaps uh, digital banks that still need to have retail business in these countries might be explained better in their behavior with this uh, business line analysis rather than the number of branches. Thank you. 
thanks. And then we have Jakob and uh, we have another person there. That, yeah. Thanks, Jacob from the EBA. So in interesting use of the data. I, I must admit, I never really thought of this as a trust problem, but let me, let me try and challenge you on the control variables, I guess, right? Uh, currency, I don't know if, if that's in the soup, but some of the banks you, you, you have have, I think, business in a number of different currencies. And as the liquidity risk management of the bank would naturally predict that you would want bonds in the same currency that you could repo quickly, either with the central bank or the market to get that particular currency and that flavor, right? Um, so, so I think that's that's definitely an issue in terms of how you operate, right? The other the other point, I guess, is, um, and I, I'm in Frankfurt, so I can say this, right? I think the monetary policy operations and how you interact as a bank with, with the central bank also varies across Europe. Typically, you're expected to interact with your local bank, right? Your local central bank, at least in certain parts. So there's also an aspect there, right? That, that you need to be conscious of the cost of having a number of different ways to turn your, your bonds into cash, right? So for me, some of your findings pretty much match what I would call normal liquidity risk management, right? In, in terms of how you would operate as a bank including in particular some of your crisis findings, right? It, it shouldn't be a surprise that if you have more volatile pricing of certain jurisdictions, government bonds, that you would try to avoid those for the, the core liquidity part of your portfolio, whereas you could take them on to make a little bit extra money uh, in, in times of peace, right? But I think in times of war, if I can use that term, then you don't want bonds that have a huge variation in price, right? So, so I think there's also that point. And then there are obstacles in terms of what you're expected to do in a given country. If you are running, let's say, your business in that country, typically there will be either direct or indirect pressure from the fiscal authorities to hold your local bonds, right? So, so I think there's a little bit of, a, of an issue in terms of leaving that out of the narrative, right? I, I still think you're right, there is a home bias. There's probably a trust issue, no doubt, but there are also, let's say, le less, less high-minded explanations for what's going on here that I, I think you should just try to control for to see how much is actually left for trust to explain what we see. Thanks. We had a question down there. Thanks, Thorsten Beck, um, EUI. Um, so this might maybe reflect a bit that I didn't pay enough attention or um, uh, my... Uh, my lack of clarity on this, but so you use the, sh the number of branches, but I mean, as somebody before said, actually the gentleman in front of me, uh, I mean, branches are for retail, um, and it, uh, would it be possible to rather use like assets um, to kind of reflect the importance of um, what is probably primarily subsidiaries, right? Because that's still the dominating uh, model in the EU, I mean, apart from the Nordic region maybe. Um, so wouldn't that be a better uh, measure? And again, you might have done this anyway. Um, maybe I just misunderstood it. Thanks. And uh, we have a question there. Yeah. Um, Jean-Edouard Collier, HEC Paris. Um, yeah, so to be the same point as, as Jacob was, was making, actually, that I, I believe the results, I believe that there is something about culture, but the interpretation in terms of trust and, and credit risk seems, I don't know, I, I find it a bit hard to to believe. I was wondering, you know, these are, these are not, for most bonds, these are not centralized markets. So couldn't there be a simpler explanation that, you know, you are BNP Paribas, you do business, in Italy or in Germany, because of this, you have many customers in those countries, you have relationships with banks in those countries, so naturally you find it easy to buy or sell bonds of those countries simply because you have the right trading relationships. And of course, there is a reason why you are in those countries in the first place, because you chose to be present there, and this might have to do with, with cultural things. So it's, it's just another way of, of looking at your results, but this sounds a bit more plausible to me, ex-ante, than just, you know, do I trust more the Germans or the Italians because of cultural stereotypes? Yeah, I think that will be the last question I've asked. Do we have anything on the WebEx? No, okay. Hi, um, it's Emanuela Benincasa from University of Zurich. So I have a question. Um, how does your story differentiate with respect to um, the 
taste-based discrimination or the statistical-based discrimination? Because I, I assume that uh, you, you are assuming that, the, I don't know, banks act irrationally. And uh, does your uh, uh, stereotype, which I, uh, implies lack of trust, uh, how this differentiate with respect to the literature on taste-based and uh, statistical discrimination? Thank you. Maybe I take advantage also of the last question. It, I, and it's picking up a bit up on what Jacob was saying also, that there are a number of dimensions and, and, and drivers here. I think you have, you have an area in, in the paper where you're sort of controlling for the SSM also. And it's true that we, are, of course, are the supervisor of the, the headquarters, but also the all of the solo subsidiaries, the 1,200 or something like that in the system right now. Where, uh, it's also true that we have done a lot of work on that, the difference between the subsidiary, the, the branches, all of the drivers for that. And then I think it's true that, yes, we are responsible for the prudential rules in the system itself. Where, but there are a number of things uh, which we are not responsible for at, at European level itself. Where, and when we looked into that, uh, I think you have been uh, looking into this, Giovanni, also in, in, in great details, where, we realize that there are a number of other things which are important. Um, it could be conduct rules, it can be market making in, in the local government bonds also. Uh, so I very much agree with Jacob that, that it, it's important that these things are controlled for uh, also difficult to do that, uh, but I think this is an important part of the exercise. So with this, let me hand over to you, uh, Orkin, for uh, possible uh, responses to all of these good questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, first of all, to, to my discussant, Eleonora. So very good points, Eleonora. Thank you very much. So just to respond briefly to um, to your suggestions. So performance aspect is definitely something that we have in, in our minds, similar to, as you said, uh, to gender literature, where you know um, the, the gender diversity is associated with better performance. Uh, here, I think the, the trick is that how are we going to calculate the specific component of that performance that relates to the to the sovereign bonds, uh, which is our kind of uh, focus in terms of investments. We can look at the general performance of the bank, kind of in a in a kind of at the bank level, bank time level. Uh, I'm not sure if that would you know directly be be a proof for the specific investment that we have in the paper uh, for, to be able to calculate the. Uh, the performance on the on the sovereign bonds only. Then we need to have like exact timings of uh, selling and buying, and what at what prices those selling and buyings happened, which is I think a bit trickier uh, than the general performance measures. But this is definitely something we are thinking about. Um, is it similar to home bias? It is not similar to home bias. So I have uh, also contributed to that literature in the past, and there are some people in the in the audience who also have done the same. Uh, home bias have many reasons. Home bias is not something that we can just like package in under one umbrella and then say that, you know, this is just home bias. There are various reasons, rational and irrational, and some of the political economy reasons uh, behind it. Uh, so this is distinctively different from home bias, especially because of the fact that we are focusing uh, even like letting go of the home exposures and just focusing on how these banks are doing in terms of their, you know, foreign exposures. Uh, I think it's uh, quite distinct in that sense. Uh, why banks not eliminate these biases? Well, it's, it's a very diff good question. My first bet would be that they are not aware of uh, these biases themselves. Uh, I mean, of course, we, we can speculate further on this. Uh, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't be able to like come up with a definitive answer, uh, but I would say like, this is uh, something just like, you know, in the literature as it, it has been shown, why are acuity analysts not aware of their biases when they're judging stocks, et cetera. I think it's just unawareness at, at this stage. That would be my uh, first best for first bet. Uh, time variation in trust would be nice. And that's that's the direction that we are taking. So we have undertaken uh, a large survey uh, in 2022. We are kind of incorporating that into, into our setting now. Uh, that's something we can uh, do. Uh, extensive margin, only extensive margin, you said. Uh, that's uh, essentially not the case. We have results also in the paper with loss of robustness checks on the intensive margin on the continuous measure. Uh, it's, it seems to be you know, working quite well. And actually, I have shown uh, the graph uh, over time where the, you can see the continuous measure that, that works. Um, and then uh, why 2010, 2020? Sorry, not why 2010 15 for crisis. We wanted to focus on the kind of crisis episode, uh, looking around 2012, which kind of stopped the crisis pressures in Eurozone, uh, with the Draghi's famous announcement, etc. So, we want to kind of you know look into a period 
which is uh, which is kind of uh, uniquely uh, characterized as a crisis episode. But we can, you can extend the sample, and then of course here one thing to to remember is that it's not just we are focusing on that on that on the subsample uh, of periods, but we are also interacting with the occurrence of a crisis in the target country. And there are, there are some countries there as a control group which are not uh, facing a crisis. Right, so the interaction that's 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 what we are focusing. And if you do that with the full sample, you see the similar results uh, uh, in the coefficient. So we just wanted to make sure that we are focused on the crisis episode. And then uh, from some of the questions, if I have time, uh, branches versus assets. I think this came up uh, a few times in the discussion. So this is, I think, a reasonable um, uh, concern, uh, especially with the digital transformation. We could maybe apply a. a Asset-based measure of you know uh, of uh, presence for these banks across Europe, so that could be one way of uh, going forward with it. As a control for branches, I mean the branches were the were the most direct intuitive control that we we thought in mind. But again, we we could we could uh, do more on that maybe by uh, adding additional controls. But however, I think with the with the additional analysis now we are adding on to the paper, especially with the IV results that they're looking at this historical uh, cultural distance across countries kind of predicting uh, the, the the trust and then uh, trust predicting the sovereign uh, debt decisions. I think that's kind of, you know, in a way mitigating these concerns that, you know, there might be omitted variables here. And then uh, in terms of, I think there, there have been some concerns in terms of uh, identification here, like some people raised uh, fiscal, uh, different fiscal policy measures of different countries, etc. I think uh, maybe I haven't done a good enough job in this short presentation to explain to you that you know we are really focusing on the same country's banks uh, with a risk you know facing another same target country. Uh, in which case, you know this country level differences should not really play a role. But if you really think that you know there are still differences within the same country pair that will play a role, that can be the case. But yeah, I, I think uh, it's probably because of the you know me not being able to. Uh, explained identification quite well. Um, and taste-based versus statistical discrimination. Uh, I think here we are arguing for a taste-based one. We don't uh, imply a kind of learning uh, and taste-based coming directly from the, from the you know, cultural upbringing of the, of the employees uh, of these banks who are making these decisions um, that kind of directly affects the, the, the decision-making. So uh, I think that's it from my notes. If I missed anything, happy to respond. Okay, thanks a lot, Joaquin. Thanks, Eleonora, for very good presentations and discussions. Um, so that, that closes the session three.